Good afternoon and welcome back to the ETF Trends webinar series. This time we're sponsored by our friends at T. Rowe Price. Uh, my name is Dave Nodding. Today I'm very excited because we're going to dig into one of the more interesting things that's happened to the ETF market really in the last 20 years, and that's this real rise of active ETFs. Lots of opportunities, lots of changes, lots of chances to improve your portfolios. Um, today we're going to talk about some of those opportunities, some of the challenges we're facing in the markets. We're going to talk about how some newly actively managed ETFs differ from the traditional ETF structure. Uh, and we're going to talk about why that's important, the benefits that you might get from that, uh, and and really how it changes the whole advisor approach. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how you can fit active ETFs into a diversified portfolio, particularly if you're not coming at this from a traditional active mutual fund, back, fund background. Uh, before we wade in too deep, uh, a couple quick housekeeping notes. Um, the most important button on your screen is definitely that Q&A box you should see right there. Um, please go ahead and answer, uh, put in any questions you have as you think of them. Don't wait till the very end. Uh, it's always better to get those questions in, know they're coming. We can help consolidate some of those questions. And if we run out of time and we don't get to your question, uh, please don't worry. We'll have somebody get back to you to answer your question individually, uh, either from us folks here at ETF Trends or from our friends at T. Rowe Price. Um, I'll go ahead and answer one question we get every single time, which is, can you get a copy of the presentation? The answer is yes. Uh, we will be sending those around along with information about a replay shortly after the webinar. Uh, however, if there's a little green folder at the bottom of your screen, that's the resources folder. In there, you'll actually find a copy of the presentation we're going to be going through today. Um, and you'll find a bunch of other things there as well. You can uh, find a link to the um, uh, ETF section of the T. Rowe Price Financial Advisor website. Um, there's a sign-up link for T. Rowe's uh, Asset Allocation Viewpoints newsletter. Um, there's a link to the active ETF channel on our site at ETF Trends uh, and some discussion about the, uh, the active ETF process over at T. Rowe Price and some of the funds we're going to be talking about here as well. So do feel free to go check those out. Um, if you're new to our webinar series, one thing we do that's a little different here is we try to get you involved as much as we can. Uh, so we'll be asking you a couple poll questions as we go through this. Really encourage you to fill those out. It uh, really helps us keep things uh, anchored in what's important to you. Uh, gives us some feedback on the topic that we're talking about in real time, which can be really helpful. Uh, and there's also a survey in the teal folder at the bottom of the screen uh, with a couple extra questions we'd love your thoughts on. We'll be grabbing uh, three advice who complete that survey and sending us Starbucks gift card just as a, a small way of saying thanks. Last, I know some of you are here for uh, continuing education credits. Uh, if you are, you'll see that yellow certificate at the bottom of your screen. When you've been here for the appropriate amount of time, you'll see a little green check mark run right through that. Uh, quick introductions here. I'm Dave Nodig. I'm the CIO here at ETF Trends and ETF Database. Very pleased to be joined by three gentlemen from T. Rowe Price. Um, Tim Coyne's been in this business forever, uh, I think at least 20 years at this point. He's the head of exchange traded funds for T. Rowe Price. Uh, we've also got Scott Livingston. He's the head of ETF strategy there. Um, and James Norangolo. Uh, I'm sure I got that wrong, uh, but he'll correct me later. He's an investment specialist in the U.S. equity group at T. Rowe Price as well. Before we jump right into the presentation, we're going to get one of those poll questions up for you here. Um, and really, it's pretty simple. Are you are you coming at this from the more mutual fund centric, perhaps slightly, uh, you know, an older way of thinking about this? Uh, or are you more of an ETF centric advisor? Are you a little bit of both or does neither apply? Maybe you're just doing single stocks and bond ladder ladders. Those things are still happening out there as well. Um, you know, I think it's been a, a real evolution here. Tim, uh, maybe while folks are taking a shot at this question, you know, you have been in this business, I think, probably as long as I have. How, how has this change really shifted? Obviously, we know ETFs have been important, but mutual funds haven't gone away. Right. No, exactly, Dave. And, you know, our, our whole premise of launching ETFs is really around being client-centric, right? And this is a conversation that has been ongoing at T. Rowe Price, quite frankly, over a past the past decade now, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in the presentation, but we, we filed for original uh, ETFs back in 2013, right, so seven years ago. And, you know, for, for taxable clients, we think that, you know, adding choice for end investors is a, is a positive and allows clients recognizing that, you know, uh, needs have evolved, expectations have evolved. 
and product preferences have evolved. So to, to us, ETFs are really a natural extension of what we do in providing investment management uh, and our strategies through different product structures. And ETF is the latest expansion of that product structure. Let's see what the audience says here to this question. Uh, a bit of a mix, which is not actually that surprising. Um, you know, I, I'm actually surprised we have so many folks that are really focused on either ETFs or mutual funds. When I talk to advisors, I tend to see most of them using a mix of the two, you know, right vehicle for the right, for right job. I, I think we're going to hand this off to James here to walk us through a little bit about T. Rowe Price and their, your sort of history in active management. James, do you want to take it away? Thanks, Dave, and it, it may not surprise you to learn that you're not the first person to have difficulty pronouncing Narungalo, um, but uh, it's all good. <laughs> Happy to be here. Good afternoon, everybody. So if we go to the next slide, uh, let me, I'll tell you a little bit about T. Rowe Price. So we offer decades of experience and success as an active U.S. equity manager, and today we are well positioned to carry out that record of success. We have over $1.2 trillion in assets under management across a global suite of equity, fixed income, and multi-asset solutions. And we entered 2020 financially strong, enabling us to continue to invest in strategic growth initiatives despite the challenging economic environment. We remain keenly focused on delivering investment success for our clients. This objective is central to everything we do. And actively managed ETFs offer another vehicle, as Tim said, for our clients to access our investment strategies. If we move to the next slide, we can see that not only are we investing across a global suite of strategies, we have investment professionals located around the world. We believe T. Rowe Price has made one of the most significant investments in fundamental research in the industry, and we continued adding to investment staff during the first half of this year. We believe that taking a longer term view, both in building our teams and in investing on behalf of clients, is the best way to succeed over time. Among our professionals are over 170 equity analysts. These are industry experts covering companies from early stage all the way up the capitalization spectrum. This means that many of the companies owned in our active ETFs are ones we have gotten to know over many years before they graduated into the large cap universe. Importantly, the vast majority of our portfolio managers came up through these analyst ranks and average over 15 years tenure here at T. Rowe Price. They help to foster and perpetuate a culture of collaboration and mentoring that is less easy to quantify through numbers, but is absolutely critical to our long-term success. In addition to our fundamental equity capabilities, we have approximately 100 fixed income research professionals around the world. And frequently, our equity and fixed analysts partner on examining a company. This has been a critical capability in 2020, as balance sheet strength, debt maturity schedules, and sources of liquidity were primary considerations amidst the economic shutdown. Our fundamental research is complemented by quantitative research professionals who provide insights on factors predictive of future returns across industries, and we have an equity data insights team who are leveraging big data to identify trends impacting industries and individual companies' prospects. We have used these data sets to gauge the success of new product launches relative to incumbents or to understand customer retention and spending rates as examples. Our scale, breadth, and depth of research resource enables us to engage deeply with company management teams their suppliers, and key customers. Our analysts conduct thousands of direct company engagements each year, and in the first five months of 2020, when the CV-19 pandemic was at its worst, our equity analysts published 50% more internal research notes than in the prior year period, providing actionable ideas to our portfolio managers. Now moving to the next slide. We recognize that the last 10 years have been difficult for the average active manager. However, we would note two things. One, you can see here periods of active out and underperformance have happened before and they tend to run in cycles. The other point we'd make is our work suggests that when you asset weight the manager universe as opposed to equally weighting, you find that the case for active markedly improves. 
This suggests that scale matters for active management success. And I've talked about our scale here at T. Rowe Price, the breadth of resources, the continual investment in growing these capabilities and our culture. Let's look at how these have translated into client outcomes on the next slide. You can see here, for example, that our U.S. equity strategies over the last 20 calendar years have delivered an extremely high rate of rolling period success net of fees and expenses relative to benchmark. And our U.S. large cap strategies outperform their benchmarks by 83 basis points annualized for the trailing 10 years. What can even a small amount of excess return mean for client outcomes? Here on the next slide, we see that for a young investor starting out today, even 25 basis points of excess return may add two full years of spending in retirement. 50 basis points can result in five extra years. Those are material improvements in client outcomes. In summary, we believe what differentiates T. Rowe Price is our global scale, the continual investment we've made in building our resources, our deep commitment to fundamental research, and a culture of collaboration across disciplines, including fixed income, quant, and the leveraging of big data sets. We acknowledge the challenge the average active manager has faced, but our approach has delivered successful client outcomes over time, which has always been our central focus. The launch of our ETFs, uh, active ETFs delivers time-tested TRO price strategies in a new form factor with the same commitment to active management success. I'll turn it back to Dave now for a poll question, and then we can get more into this form factor. Great. Yeah. So we, we asked the first question there about, uh, you know, your use of ETFs and mutual funds. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about active and passive. Uh, so we've given you a couple options here. You know, do you use active for core? Do you use a blend for core? Are you mostly using index products, but also still toe into some active management? Or are you just pure passive? And I think, um, Tim, maybe I'll, I'll loop you back into this discussion as well. You know, thinking about this from, you know, where we've come from in an institutional perspective, there really has been this sort of move first into a lot of passive, but then a little bit coming back. How do, how do you sort of see that pendulum of the use of active management over the last 20 or 30 years? Yeah, and I think, um, I think Dave, you kind of hit on it in the beginning here, right? We talked about kind of offering choice in, in product structure, but I think, you know, for end advisors, having the right tools in their toolkit to kind of navigate through different market cycles, I think is critical. And um, as noted, a lot of advisors use both active and passive. And, you know, for us, with, with delivering ETFs and our active capabilities, like right, we're an active shop, as, as we've discussed, and kind of like it's really impressive the investment process at T. Rowe Price and how we're delivering that investment process through our strategies to end investors. Like having that ability to now engage in a product that a client has grown a preference for, namely ETF, um, that's really a big step for us. And again, that's opening a new pathway for investors to access not only active strategies, but with T. Rowe Price and our premier um, product and in, in investment uh, management uh, process that, that, that again, um, is now just being reflected through these, uh, through these new products. So I think there's a place for both active and passive in portfolios. Uh, our job is really to deliver our investment management capability through the right product structure to allow investors um, to basically, you know, gravitate towards the product uh, that, that fits their needs. Yeah, and if, if we look here, you know, that seems to be in line with what we've seen. I think there is a bit of a myth that, you know, all advisors have moved to being all indexed. And, and really, that's really just not the case. I mean, even in this sampling of a few hundred advisors who are here now, you know, we've only got about six or seven percent of the audience that's saying, "Nah, I'm pretty much pure passive." Everybody else has got some sort of a blend going on. So I think it's a really opportune opportun uh, opportune moment to be having this conversation because really now for the first time we are seeing some of these world class active strategies show up in an ETF wrapper. So um, Tim, with that in mind, why don't you take us through sort of some of the ETF evolution we've gotten to here? Yeah, great. Thank you, Dave. And it's, it's great to be here today and have the opportunity just to discuss T. Rowe Price ETFs. 
Um, you know, as you've mentioned, I've been involved in the ETF market for 20 years now, just 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 shy of forever. But um, I do feel very fortunate to have played a part in and, and really witnessed the growth and overall evolution of the ETF industry. Um, you know, it's an industry that has grown to 4.5 trillion in assets under management in the U.S., so pretty significant. And, and for a long time, you know, I, I think ETFs are, were really synonymous with passive investing, but but that's changed. And ETFs now represent different approaches to investing and represent various asset classes asset classes across both passive and the active landscape. And if you look at the evolution of the ETF industry in the slide here, you know, it dates back to 1993 with the uh, launch of SPY in the U.S. You know, and for the first decade or so, it was really, you know, not only were ETFs synonymous with passive, but ETFs were synonymous with equity exposure, right? It wasn't until 2002 that you saw the first fixed income product come to market. And, you know, I think with fixed income, it's, it's fair to say there was early days, there was gradual growth. There were really, and, and a fair amount of skepticism around fixed income ETFs. But after coming out of the financial crisis, you did see a significant um, growth uh, trajectory in fixed income ETFs that continues today. Um, and then you, you know, you continue the evolution to smart, smart beta and factor investing. Um, and then in 2008, active ETFs, right? Fully transparent active ETFs came to market. Um, that is still a relatively small uh, percentage of the overall asset base for ETFs. And if you really drill down on active ETFs in market today, for the, um, the majority of those assets are actually in fixed income instruments. So um, this is, you know, with our structure and the new active approach, uh, you're going to see, I think, a lot more premier strategies coming to market from major asset managers now being able to deliver their, those strategies in the ETF structure while being able to uh, shield their uh, investment IP. I would also, um, you know, the, 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 these, these products, I think, really have the ability over time to, to kind of really carve out a significant space in the ETF uh, industry. And I would say even further than that, kind of more broadly into the ETF industry. So, Dave, as you can see, um, if we could uh, switch the slides, yep, perfect. As you can see on this slide, uh, the T row price journey to ETFs, it's, it's been a lengthy one. And T row price was the first asset manager to file for active ETFs through a new approach, delivering our investment strategies, as I mentioned, while protecting our investment IP. And from the beginning, T row price has, has we've, been, we've been centered on clients, right? This, this wasn't a knee jerk reaction, us entering the ETF space. It was really through years of conversations with clients and getting feedback from clients, uh, recognizing that there was a, again, an evolution in thought and a recognition that clients did have a preference for um, having the ability to have choice in how they were engaging with our, with our products. Uh, and, and again, this is simply providing a new pathway for investors through ETFs um, with all of the embedded benefits of the ETF structure. And we recognize that our clients' needs and expectations continue to evolve. And part of that's where we've been, you know, it's continued growth and, and growing preference to the ETF structure. So we've been listening to our clients. We've been committed to delivering our, our strategies through different investment structures. I would also say noteworthy that during this lengthy approval process, I think one of the benefits that actually came out of that, it gave us the ability to really focus on building out our capabilities around ETF. So over the past three plus years, we've really been focusing on our operational readiness, right? Building out our ETF capabilities, uh, building a strong foundation and operational infrastructure. You know, we had multiple work streams. We had over 250 associates within T. Rowe Price dedicated to working and building out our capabilities around, uh, around active ETF and the delivery of that uh, we also have developed external ETF partner support with liquidity providers. That's been a big focus of ours with market makers, uh, all of the big banks and authorized participants and broker dealers that have dedicated ETF trading desks. Um, not only, you know, kind of the, the support that's critical to our products and, um, and quoting and trading and, and maintaining, uh, you know, a high degree of market quality, 
uh, if they've also been involved through the process as, you know, through the development phase. And, and Scott Livingston will talk a little bit more about our structure and how we're delivering active ETFs to market. Um, but, you know, we work not only across our organization, but externally with market participants to ensure that we were building a very resilient foundation and uh, ultimately long-term business. Um, and then we were also focused on our launch readiness, right? Really working with our sales teams, um, doing a lot of ETF training, uh, you know, with key stakeholders internally, uh, beyond even the sales team, working with our marketing team, legal, compliance, et cetera. And ultimately, you know, what's happening is we're, we're looking really to build out our ETF business and franchise and knowledge, but also really weave that into the fabric of T. Rowe Price. And again, this just becomes another vehicle for us uh, to deliver our investment strategies and for investors to access us. And, you know, the question I get a lot is like, why now, right? I don't think um, a lot of people fully understand the fact that, you know, the, 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 the process to actually get through the full regulatory approval has taken so long. Um, but it's pretty straightforward for, for us, right? We, we just recently received that approval to launch active ETFs. It was, it was really about having the right model to fit our strategies um, and ultimately protect our, our clients. And final approval from the regulators uh, came in July, and we ended up launching our first four products in August, uh, on August 5th, actually. And those first four ETFs are based on existing strategies, right? This is, this is phase one. Our long-term plan is to build a comprehensive product suite across uh, asset classes. And ETFs are, are, again, just that natural extension of what we do. So we view our ETFs build out as a marathon, not a sprint, right? I, I talked about that kind of deep foundation and, and strong foundation that we're focused on building. Uh, and we recognize that these are new products, uh, not just, you know, for T. Rowe Price launching ETFs, but it's also a new product type in the industry. And, you know, we expect gradual long-term acceptance and growth, much like, you know, other structures or asset classes in the ETF market. And as I mentioned with fixed income, I think that's a good example. That was kind of slow and steady growth and really started to take off after the financial crisis. And I do think our timing is pretty good here. Um, because I think, you know, yes, the ETF landscape, it, it really has been about kind of passive products. And, and maybe that worked, you know, in a, in a kind of gradual market that was ticking up over a decade. Um, but I think, you know, we've entered into some kind of choppy waters now. And even through the recovery, not all sectors have kind of rebounded the same. So, you know, again, leaning back on our, you know, kind of time proven investment management process, uh, I think can be really a value add to end investors. In addition to the fact that, again, you can now access some of our, you know, premier strategies through, uh, through an ETF. And then on the next slide, um, really looking at the features of the ETF structure. A as discussed, right, ETFs now represent different investment approaches, both active and passive. Uh, not only that, uh, there are different ETF structures and asset classes represented across both active and passive, uh, passive products. And in addition to that, there's also different uh, disclosure methods and schedules, right? Um, and so I think you're going to continue to see this space grow. And now that there is that availability to bring an active strategy to market while protecting IP and providing a lot of uh, intraday data to market makers uh, to make effective, efficient, continuous pricing, this becomes very compelling, I think, both to investors as well as to asset managers who, you know, now have that pathway and feel more comfortable basically delivering those strategies to the end investor. Um, but again, at, at, at the center of this discussion is the product. It's the ETF structure and all the associated benefits that come with ETFs, right? And that includes the tax efficiency, and that is all you know, comes through the creation and redemption. And again, Scott will talk a little bit more about the mechanics of our product, but you know, we designed our products really to look very similar to existing products in the workflow of market makers um, and other liquidity providers, uh, both in the primary and secondary market is the same. Uh, the convenience, right? The added flexibility to an investors and the versatility to be able to buy or sell shares intraday. 
uh, that's an added feature uh, in the ETF. And then finally, uh, these products are cost effective, right? There's lower operating costs on ETFs, which allow us to be very competitive in, in, in price points and how we bring our strategies to market. So again, our, our goal, we're not looking to displace any structures or any other methods that clients have to access this, whether that's through mutual funds or uh, SMAs or other trust structures, this is just in addition to that. And again, it's about basically meeting our clients and the needs of our clients. So I'll pause there. Yeah, great. So that was, a, I think, a good overview. We're going to dig a little bit more into the specifics of the ETF structure because there's some interesting stuff there. Um, but we're going to take a little detour here and just ask some folks about some stuff we're seeing in the market right now. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about growth versus value strategies. Um, we're going to get into some of the specific products that T. Rowe's been launching here and how that may play into this. Um, but we're just sort of interested to get the pulse from the advisor community who's attending today where are you seeing the real value? We've obviously had this huge momentum growth run uh, in particularly in tech stocks and sort of NASDAQ 100 type names. There's been a lot of discussion about, you know, is value still going to be relevant? Uh, maybe, James, this is an opportunity to bring you in here. What are, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, you're, you're obviously taking a look at the markets, talking to people every day. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, we'd certainly acknowledge that there have been segments of the value universe that are, that are facing, you know, significant challenges. We've been saying for some time that a significant segment of the S&P 500 are facing secular forces that, you know, may result in permanent changes to the prospects of certain businesses and industries. And so on the other side of that, you can obviously say that a number of the growth names are benefiting from those same secular forces. And, and so we'd say that, you know, growth is a as a segment has really earned the outperformance that they've posted over the last, you know, since the great, great financial crisis in 2007, you know, significant gaps in earnings per share and cash flow per share from the growth index relative to value. So definitely growth has, has kind of earned that outperformance. But in the current environment, um, we have started to move to a more balanced posture. We have been overweighted growth relative to value in our multi-asset portfolios, but more recently have moved to sort of a balanced posture because value, we need to be cognizant of the fact that the, the substantial discount from a, from a PE and other metrics uh, standpoint relative to growth is material. And if you have expectations that the economy is going to continue recovering, uh, you know, names within the growth uh, complex do have some prospect to start performing better. And so we think it makes sense to have a balanced exposure, but we would emphasize no surprise that we think you need to be active and selective in value, avoiding those areas that are facing perhaps permanent secular disruption and focusing on beaten down names that have improving prospects trading right now on trough earnings expectations and trough multiples. Economy starts to continue to improve. Those companies are pretty well positioned, we think, to demonstrate some outperformance, and that's why we want to have that balanced exposure. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I'll put up the the results here. And uh, my favorite part of the results here is actually the 11 percent of you are honest enough to say that you have absolutely no clue. I would put myself in that book bucket entirely for all the reasons you just said, which is that you know we really don't even understand what value and growth necessarily mean in this new economy, and so therefore looking at this from a whole total market lens trying to figure out what the new economy is really going to look like strikes me uh, as, as probably the smartest way to think about it. And that sort of leans into the active management discussion. Thanks. Um, we're going to hand it over to Scott here, I think, for a few minutes to talk to us a little bit more about some of the structure and then some of the specific products that you guys are launching. Scott? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Uh, so let's dive right into TR Price's new active ETFs. As Tim mentioned, we've been working on a solution for quite some time that would allow us to offer our clients our investment strategies in an ETF wrapper. We've really seen the growth of ETFs overall as Tim covered, and we've heard from investors that have developed a preference for the vehicle type. As certain investors continue to warm up to ETFs, it was only natural we'd seek to access our strategies through this wrapper. And indeed, that's what we've heard from some of our biggest clients. Our challenge to this point, really, um, has been that the SEC previously required all issuers seeking to launch an ETF to provide daily portfolio holdings disclosure as a condition for approval. We've been very concerned about this requirement as an active manager, since we believe it could lead to the front running of our trading strategies, which would you know, certainly harm the 
harm the performance of our investors. At the same time, we realized that the daily disclosed holdings were used by market makers for valuation purposes. These are the firms whose job it is to support ETFs in market by maintaining orderly trading markets, and that's certainly a critical function for all exchange-traded securities. If a market maker has the underlying holdings of a fund, then it's, um, it's easier to keep markets trading near the true NAV of the product, or ETFs trading near the true NAV of the product. And further, the more confidence a market maker has in its ability to value and trade the products, the tighter the spread is likely to be. At the same time, it was our belief, however, that a successful ETF could be designed that featured fewer holdings disclosures. In fact, we believe the holdings file essentially just served as a pricing signal for market makers and that other strong pricing signals could be developed so that they could still perform this critical role in market. We consulted with some of the most prominent ETF market makers in the industry to test our thesis. And really what we found quickly was that these firms not only agreed with our thoughts and our theory, but they saw a lot of promise in active ETFs, and they were very willing to, to dive in and help us design our process. This collaboration and partnership is really a key part of our model, and I'll discuss this a bit more in detail in a bit, uh, but it, it's enabled us to design a process that fits seamlessly into the existing ETF ecosystem. It was that ETFs have traded efficiently for so many years because of how well the process works and the critical role that market makers play, so why change it? As I walk through our process, you will hopefully notice that our model closely mirrors how ETFs have traded since their introduction in the U.S. market back in 1993. And I'd say that, that was completely intentional. Our primary pricing signal is our proxy basket, which we publish each day. Our proxy basket is designed to be a highly correlated with our current holdings and our fund, and market makers use it exactly as they would a holdings basket for a daily disclosed fund. Traditionally, daily disclosed baskets have also been used to facilitate creation or redemption activity between APs or authorized participants and issuers. In our process, we structure the creation and redemption mechanism the exact same way. Our daily disclosed proxy basket can be used to create or redeem ETF units, which essentially increases or decreases shares outstanding for our ETF. In addition, we provide a 15-second IIV, or an intraday indicative value, based on our current holdings which serves as a strong secondary pricing signal and allows market makers to recalibrate the pricing models as needed. Finally, we publish a suite of risk metrics to quantify the close relationship between the proxy basket and our current holdings. These include daily portfolio de deviation, performance deviation, tracking error, portfolio overlap between the baskets, et cetera. The process we've designed and the one the SEC approved enables us to now package our investment strategies as an ETF wrapper without putting our investment performance at risk. Importantly, our ETFs will provide to investors the same benefits they are accustomed to with daily disclosed ETFs, namely, as Tim covered, the increased tax efficiency, the convenience and versatility of the vehicle, and finally, potentially lower cost. We're gonna spend more time drilling into the client experience of our ETFs and the mechanics under the hood, but to first address the question posed at the top of the slide, what is different about the ETFs? I'd suggest the answer is not a whole lot. Moving on to the investor experience slide. And just as we previously highlighted, it's the same trading process for daily disclosed ETFs. At the top of our list as we embarked on this ETF journey was making absolutely sure that investors would be able to transact at reasonable spread levels in our products and they'd be able to realize all the benefits of the ETF wrapper. That's exactly what we've done. If you're comfortable trading current ETFs in market, you'll be comfortable trading these new ETFs as they'll trade and settle the same way. From a disclosure perspective, investors get all the same information they're accustomed to receiving for our active mutual funds. Investors get full quarterly holdings disclosure, they get monthly portfolio information, and even the same daily information I mentioned earlier, including a proxy basket, IIV, and risk metrics. We do stop short of publishing our holdings daily, but again, this is coming from a good spot since we want to protect the performance returns of our clients. That's not to say our products are semi-transparent or non-transparent or, or even ants, which has become a new nickname that uh, has been used to, the, to explain these products. Quite frankly, we don't think these names are accurate for a product since we offer investors a lot of disclosure, as I've just covered. We prefer to call these products active ETFs as that's truly what they are. Over time, we believe investors will focus on performance and cost, and, and certainly trading spread, which is part of cost, when making a, a buying decision on the products. For now, we understand there'll be a focus on the proxy approach or Presidium's APR model. And, and we do think the details under the hood are very interesting. But no matter what the approach an asset manager uses, the goal of this process is the same, to protect investment IP while extending investors the benefits of the ETF wrapper. 
how it gets delivered, whether it's a proxy, an APR, or a daily disclosed holdings file, it's really the plumbing of these products. When, you know, one way to think about it, when consumers shop for a product online, they tend to look at the quality of the product, the price. Uh, very few base their buying decisions on whether, um, you know, there's a specific delivery company that's going to deliver it or which carrier it is shipping the product. Sure, they'd love the process to be efficient and, and cost as, as little as possible. And I'd suggest this will be the same for our ETFs in the long run. We've created a process that results in efficient trading and, and thus minimizes the delivery costs. Just like passive investors check to see their passive ETFs has met the index return, our active ETF investors will want these products to beat their benchmark. So, you know, we really think the big story here is investors now have the ability to access tier price active management in a wrapper that they may find relatively attractive. Moving on to the view of the market maker in our process for our ETFs. And as I mentioned again previously, there's not a lot of change for them either. Um, they're going to use our pricing signals to facilitate efficient market and to ensure ETFs trade around their true value intraday. The collaboration that Tim mentioned and, and I talked about a little bit earlier that we've developed with these firms throughout our design process has really resulted in broad support for our ETFs trading and market. Uh, it's still early, but our spreads have been between a penny and four cents. Uh, that's been the range roughly on a 25 NAV for our four products since launch. That works out to, you know, three to 16 basis points. And that's quite attractive compared, especially to other active products that have recently launched using different models. But even if you can extend that to the, the existing ETF universe as a whole. Importantly, we've also had sufficient liquidity in our products. Um, many liquidity providers are involved, resulting in impressive depth of book and overall great market quality. We think this is critical, and we think it means investors are able to trade in size in our products without much market impact. While trading volumes are gonna build over time, just like they will for, for any new launch, our liquidity is much better than what you could see on screen, and our ETFs can easily handle large trades just as they do in our mutual fund counterparts. So while we've been very pleased with our early trading results, we're also taking a very active role in ensuring our products continue to trade well. Going back to my example on the last slide about consumers considering online purchases and the delivery companies essentially being the ones managing the plumbing, I'd say that tier price is, is, is really the plumber here. While we and a few others have, have paved the path for others to bring active management to market in ETF wrapper, we're taking it a step further. We're actively managing the logistics of our delivery method, much like UPS or FedEx would do. We've created and developed new tools to ensure that we could observe and manage our pricing signals real time in market to ensure that they remain strong for market makers. Again, our view is if our pricing signals remain strong over time, so will our market quality. The second key role played by large banks uh, in the creation and redemption process uh, by authorized participants or APs. In our process, APs are able to directly create redeem ETF units with zero price, just as they do with passive ETF issuers today. There are no new parties or costs created in our process. Again, we've stuck to what's worked well for almost three decades in the ETF industry. And I think APs have certainly appreciated that. In fact, we've had extremely broad support from APs for this process. Creating, redeeming, and kind unlocks the potential tax efficiency of the ETF vehicle, as issuers can select low-cost tax lot shares to satisfy redemptions, instead of selling stocks and delivering cash, as in some other vehicles. Our goal as an active manager continues to be to buy low and sell high, obviously. This in-kind mechanism allows us to potentially mitigate the tax implications that are created by having to sell securities to satisfy redemptions. Moving on to the next slide, and really we just want to spend a minute summarizing the, the pertinent points here in our process. We've long believed in a vehicle agnostic approach. We, we focus on delivering alpha to our clients and packaging it whatever wrapper works best for them. We've undertaken all this work because we've always been focused on what's best for clients. And for a subset of our clients and for other investors in the industry, the ETF wrapper is certainly a compelling way to access our strategies. So what we've done here is simply create an active ETF. The structure was approved by the SEC as an ETF. It's not some other vehicle type. Uh, we provide all types of information to market makers to ensure efficient markets. At the same time, we provide ETF investors with all the portfolio information they're accustomed to receiving for other vehicles, including mutual funds. Importantly, we also protect our IP um, so that we're able to efficiently trade into and out of positions without being front run in our investment strategies. Again, we haven't made any major changes to the ETF ecosystem. We have broad support from key parties involved in ETF trading. 
Um, and just as I said, we expect that to continue. We're also taking an active role in ensuring that that, that does continue. Um, you know, in closing, I'd say this is really evolution, not revolution. Uh, we think this is a really exciting time for ETF investors and even the ETF industry as a whole. Um, active ETFs on the equity side could definitely be the next chapter of the ETF story. So moving along to our product slide. Um, on August 5th, these are the, the first four ETFs we've brought to market. I want to spend a couple minutes talking about them. These are flagship funds for our company. They're run by portfolio managers, as you can see, that are well tenured. And they've performed really well over time. Um, we've now given investors access to some of our best investment strategies in an ETF wrapper. Blue chip growth, ticker TCHP, or T-chip as I like to call it. The objective here is to provide long-term capital growth by investing in common stocks of large and medium-sized blue chip companies that have potential for above average earnings growth and are well established. The second is growth stock, ticker T-GROW or T-G-R-W. Uh, here we seek to long-term capital growth and invest in companies that have one or more of the following, superior growth and earnings, cash flow, ability to sustain earnings momentum, even during economic slowdowns, occupation of a lucrative niche in the economy, and, and the ability to expand even during times of, of slow economic growth. The third is dividend growth ETF, ticker TDVG. It seeks dividend income and long-term capital growth by investing in the majority of its assets and common stocks of dividend-paying companies expected to increase their dividends over time. And last but certainly not least is our equity income product, TEQI or Techie. It seeks a high level of dividend income and long-term capital growth by investing most of its assets in common stocks with an emphasis on large capitalization stocks that have a strong track record. I would say there's additional information on each of these products on our website at twoerprice.com on our ETF page. We've also pro provided performance exhibits in the appendix for each of the strategies for your review. The SEC has required these new products to stick to domestic equity strategies for now, uh, but over time we're hoping the list of allowable securities will grow, or strategies will grow. From a T-Row price perspective, we're committed to the space and are planning to offer a robust suite of ETF products across asset class and regions over time. I would say our new active ETFs build on our tradition of innovation, really for the benefit of our clients, and we believe they'll serve as a complement to our existing offerings, as well as provide us with a potential path for future growth for the firm. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Dave. Sure. Um, we're going to toss up a, a poll question. We always uh, we toss up at the end. Anytime we mention a ticker or a fund, we always toss up a, a slide like this, which just sort of says, are any of these of particular interest to you? Um, and, you know, we, we didn't spend a lot of time digging into pitching specific products here. So maybe, uh, Scott, I'd love to just ask you a question. You, know, you mentioned that there were a few limitations about what you could be launching right now. Obviously, international equity is not really approved yet. Um, what is it about these four funds to an outsider like, say, me, that, that put them to the top of the list of things that you want to make sure are in the ETF wrapper for clients? Yeah, that's a great question, Dave. And, and obviously, this is a starting point for us. The SEC requirement was that they'd only approve strategies where the underlying stocks traded contemporaneously with the ETF. So that essentially cut the universe down to domestically traded stocks or exchange listed ADRs. Um, so starting there and thinking about our domestic equity franchise, obviously a lot of great potential strategies we could put in an ETF wrapper, and I suspect we will over time. What really made these four stand out is they're large flagship funds for, for, our, uh, for our company. Again, well-tenured PMs have performed increasingly, uh, exceedingly well over time. They're also large retail franchises. So as we think about the users of ETFs, I think these strategies are quite familiar with the, the average ETF user. Um, I would categorize these as some of our best investment strategies. So when we think about new vehicles, these are certainly at the top of the list, whether that be SMA, um, separate accounts, trust. These are strategies that our investors know and love. They're, you know, they've been quite a long time in the firm. So it felt like a great place for us to start. Obviously, we have two growth funds in the mix that have done well. Uh, we started also with a dividend strategy and, and finally value. Uh, I think you will see more from us over time. But these were, um, again, flagship funds that felt like a great place to start in our initial ETF suite. 
Awesome. Great. Well, I've got a bunch of questions that have come in. Thanks, everybody, for having sent those in. Um, before we jump into that, I just want to remind folks if some of your questions might be answered in that little green resources folder at the bottom, um, certainly you can get the deck there. But, uh, you know, you can also subscribe to that to your price asset allocation viewpoint letter um, and get some of the additional resources about these specific products because we did sort of blow through the through those parts of it pretty quickly. Um, I want to make sure we've got about 15 minutes for questions. and We've got quite a few detailed ones here, so I'm going to toss a bunch of these out. Um, and Scott, maybe I'll just stick with you on some of these various product specific ones um, and structural ones to start with. Uh, a couple of folks have asked, you know, what the expense ratio differences are between the ETFs versus the mutual funds of the same strategy. Is there a sort of a blanket answer for that? Yeah, there is, Dave. And, and um, these are clone strategies. So obviously they mimic the existing mutual fund strategies. Our pricing philosophy has been uh, regardless of whether it's a mutual fund or ETF, is there's typically a management fee associated with an investment strategy. Um, so that will be consistent between our mutual fund version and our ETF format. From there, in building into the total expense ratio, um, we also consider cost. On the mutual fund side, there are several costs that are inherent in that structure that aren't really present on the ETF side. So the to while the management fees will be similar, between the strategies, the total expense ratios can be lower in the ETF wrapper, essentially because of the operational efficiency and the cost savings. We pass that all on to clients and our investors. And while our, our ETF is a unitary fee, um, it's listed that way, how we build into it was really just management fee plus operating expenses, which are expected to be minimal over time for the ETF wrapper. Got it. Um, I think this one's probably for James, um, but if, if not, please redirect me. Um, but we have a couple of questions, all that I would put under the same bucket, which would be how similar these funds are. I'll, I'll read a couple of versions of it. Um, are there any expected tracking error predictions? Um, are you going to have the same sort of high concentration positions like the Amazon positions that are some of the in these right now? Um, how, how much slippage should you expect between this and the mutual fund? A whole bunch of questions in that vein. James, is there sort of some more color you can give us there on how these funds are going to be managed, whether they're going to be differences and what, what investors should really expect? I might defer to Scott on this, um, because, and I think he alluded sure. to it uh, just a bit. But, um, but Scott, do you want to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to jump in. So, uh, Dave, as I said in the prior question, these are clones. Um, so they're, they're managed by the same portfolio managers, obviously, and the same method and same strategy. The only difference, and touched on it a bit earlier, is some of them have some foreign exposure. Uh, we're able to replicate that using exchange-traded ADRs, so we're not concerned. But as you think about other non-exchange-traded products like private placements, there are times when some of these strategies will uh, buy a private placement. That obviously is not something we're able to do on the ETF side. So we're expecting tracking error to be really tight between the ETF and the mutual fund. It is the same strategy. Uh, we can't link it to the composite because this is a new vehicle. Um, but over time, we're expecting these the, the, the different formats of the same strategy to perform very much in line. Great. A um, couple, couple other ones. I'll stick with you here, Scott. I think these are a little more structural. And then, Tim, I have a few for you as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about the sort of tax implications here? You know, how capital gains will be managed in these active ETFs? Are you able to take advantage of the you know, tax deferral advantages that ETFs often get? Talk a little bit about the internal taxation issues. Yeah, sure, Dave. And, and first, I'd offer that the, the value proposition really in our ETFs is the, the value that we can add for performance and how that contributes to the investor's portfolio. Uh, the ETF certainly brings added relative tax efficiency and, and lower costs and convenience, as I've covered. But when I say relative tax efficiency, I'm referring to other vehicles that investors can use to access our active management. Um, if we think about passive, on, on the passive side, there's the ability to be 100% tax efficient through custom baskets and some other features that these new active ETFs cannot yet tap into. We hope in time they'll be able to. But remember, their objective on the passive side, it's a commoditized product and, and they compete on liquidity, price, tax efficiency, et cetera. Many of those ETFs are trading vehicles. So if you think about SPY, and, which is the most traded security in the world, uh, with the two-sided volume they have and um, – the fact that they're not trading and they're just rebalancing quarterly, they can be managed in a really tax efficient manner. Um, 
if we think about our active ETFs, our focus is really on performance. Um, we're going to buy low. We're going to sell high. Um, these are going to be investment vehicles. I think they're going to trade it differently in the fact that they're not going to be used as trading vehicles with that crazy two-sided flow that we see in some ETFs. There's certainly going to be a lot of volume. Um, but since we're actively trading in the product, it's natural that we're going to recognize gains over time. Um, our investors will be buy and hold, and, and, and we don't expect them to be trading into or out of them frequently. If our PM sells the security when, when the thesis is played out, it's going to be at a higher price, and they're going to move on to the next investment idea, but it could be at a gain. Um, so, so to summarize, I appreciate the focus on tax efficiency. I'd say for our active ETFs, it's a beneficial feature, and it's relative to some of the other vehicles. We're not claiming that these will be 100% tax efficient, but we are claiming that we could produce alpha in this vehicle that's relatively more tax efficient. Um, and that's really the value proposition here. So certainly we have an eye tax efficiency and, and we think that'll be present in our vehicle, but I wanna set expectations correctly that it's not going to be something that is 100% tax efficient over time if we're doing our job correctly. Yeah, I think a lot of folks who may be a little bit newer to the ETF structure don't realize that that tax efficiency we talk about in the ETF structure requires people to take money out, right? That, that tax efficiency comes from redemptions and long-term growth buy and hold strategies. If you're doing the job, probably not a lot of people taking the money out on a regular basis. So it can make it difficult to actually realize some of those efficiencies if it's just people putting money in. So yeah, good point. Good point. Um, Tim, I'm going to come to you with this one. A um, couple questions about where the product line might be headed. Uh, you mentioned that you know a lot of this was in response to investor demand. We have a couple questions here. I'll read one that's a version of it, which is, you know, what is what is your thinking around ETF development and improvements in the lineup over time? Sort of what are you hearing from current clients and current advisors? What are they clamoring for? Yeah, and, and that's been um, that's that's kind of an evolving conversation that we're having with clients right now. As you know, as of January first, we kind of stood up our ETF business within T Row Price. Uh, we officially now kind of have an ETF strategy piece of 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 our firm and, and of the ETF group. Um, so that's really a work that's been evolving. We've been uh, kind of on two fronts, right? Really working internally uh, with the investment teams, uh, with our multi-asset class teams, as we're thinking about kind of future products, um, thinking about existing strategies, right, across equities. Um, but also looking at other asset classes, including fixed income. So, you know, we we started a body of work around fixed income and developing our capabilities there. I kind of talked a little bit earlier about just kind of really building that, you know, uh, infrastructure. That's that's ongoing work as well. Um, as Scott mentioned, there's also some limitations in terms of what we can bring through the uh, you know shielding IP in the in the current structure that we're using for our four products. So uh, with fixed income, you know, uh, I guess just structurally, we feel that you know we may be able to develop active ETF in a fully transparent because some of the concerns that we have with equity products, you know, they're they're less prominent with fixed income. So, um, so that's an area of focus as well is building out our fixed income capabilities and looking to bring. Uh, some of our uh, fixed income strategies to market. So, you know, I think I think it's fair to say we're looking across the investment horizon, working both internally across our investment teams and multi-asset class teams to think about uh, the structures that um, we want to deliver. But crucial to this conversation is is clients, right? So we're working very closely with our distribution teams and ultimately within clients. Uh, to get their views and opinions on, you know, certain asset classes or certain gaps, perhaps in our lineup or maybe even in the the broader uh, industry right now that we could potentially fill. So, you know, long term, fast forward, we're looking to build a comprehensive product suite across asset classes. We're starting in the U.S., but over time, we're also looking at expanding into other regions. And for T. Rowe Price, that's been a that's been a focus as well over you know a, a long period of time now is really building out our brand and capabilities, and as James alluded to, kind of our investment capabilities across different regions. So, you know, we're we're very early days. This is phase one, but there's a lot more to come, and we're continuing. Maybe one more point uh, to continually resource our ETF team. So we're looking to build out our capabilities. Um, 
you know, within our team as well and add additional resources, uh, both through the product development process, but also uh, having more dedicated ETF specialists uh, and experienced professionals to work directly with our sales team and ultimately within clients to really have that go anywhere conversation. And uh, we're committed to the education and support of these products with clients. So not to not to just pile on Tim, but uh, you know you you mentioned earlier that like you know a big part of this is about being structure agnostic, right? You're an investment manager, not a not you know your your job is not to come up with plumbing. Your job is to get investment expertise into the hands of investors. Um, and and now that that seems to be coming to fruition, right? We have multiple of these sort of next gen active structures out there. Um, it seems to be being pretty widely accepted. As you pointed out, you guys are trading it, you know, a couple penny spreads. Um, money has flowed in. So what does that mean for the ETF landscape, right? If, if, if it's now sort of a all bets are off and everything can be available basically in almost any structure, what do you think that means for ETFs? Is it going to, is this a, a, a real, are we going to look back and say that this was a critical moment and everything was different after this? Um, I, I think so. I do. And, you know, and as I mentioned, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Like, again, we're, we're taking this and we're being very thoughtful, I think, in our approach, even as it pertains to kind of the, the, the market support, right? And we talked a bit about our engagement with market makers. Like, a goal of ours when we launched our first product was to have double-digit number of authorized participants to create Redeem in our, in our funds. We launched with 11. Right. So that just gives you an example of how we're thinking about the infrastructure, how we're thinking about the support. Um, and, and as I mentioned, with fixed income and other new structures or, or new asset classes in, you know, that are brought to market, there, there certainly is a period of acceptance, a time in market that clients are going to evaluate, see how the products perform. We're, we're well aware of that. And, you know, we're, we're building resiliency, and that's our goal here. Uh, recognizing that when we're having a client conversation this week, uh, it's not about the sale that, you know, or the uh, solution that we're providing to the investor today. It's also about what, what our products look like nine months from now, right? And ensuring that we have consistency in our approach, in our support, uh, both internally and externally. So I think that this is going to be, uh, play a major part in, you know, not only the ETF industry, but I think with the asset management industry, right? Because now that there is a pathway to, to bring, um, you know, premier strategies to market in the ETF structure, I do think it's a game changer. And I think if that lane is opened over a period of time, I think it is going to really resonate with clients. And, you know, as we mentioned, that has ETFs in general have become a, prefer, a preferred path of engagement and i think that's going to continue and we talked about the benefits so you know if if that pathway is open we do feel that clients will travel that pathway so great I, I do well we have a couple a uh, couple last questions sorry go ahead that was it thanks oh okay great uh i wanted to just talk a couple quick questions here towards the end as we're sort of navigating some of these last disclosure slides scott this is probably for you um any plans or a uh, current opportunity to convert a mutual fund into an etf as a kind of non-taxable event i think that means more from like a shareholder perspective if i'm an existing holder say in the blue chip fund is there a way for me to get into the etf without having to necessarily sell out and maybe book a gain yeah, sure. There's, I think there's a lot of um, lawyers doing a lot of work on this right now. I know it's a, a, a hot topic in the ETF industry. Our view currently is we do not understand that that can be a tax-free uh, transaction. The act of selling a mutual fund and buying an ETF will generate taxes. As far as conversions, uh, we have a, a pretty active and rigorous approach to managing our various investment strategies and vehicles. We don't necessarily think, as we said all along, that you know putting something in an ETF will make an unsuccessful strategy successful. Uh, instead, if we think we have a strategy that makes a lot of sense as an ETF, we'll, we'll seek to launch it as an ETF. And I think that's what you'll see us do over time. Um, we'll continue that disciplined approach to managing both our strategies and vehicles. But I don't think conversion, right. tax-free conversions are, are in our future in the near term. 
not not in the near future. Okay, last qu- last question, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. We've had a, a bunch of questions about transparency. Um, a general question about how important you're hearing, how important transparency is for most investors, whether this has been much of a hurdle. And then just a very specific question, when should an investor expect to actually see the fund holdings after a quarter end? Like what's the, what's the lag time there? I, I'll uh, jump Scott in um, as far as uh, yeah, sure, sure, Dave. So our our disclosure policy is quarterly on a 15 day lag. That's when we publish our holdings for for mutual funds and for our ETFs. Um, transparency. And there's a lot of different ways to to define that. I think investors want to know what they're purchasing, and in the case of a passive product, showing the holdings there. I don't think there's a whole lot of value. At the same time, um, in our active products, we have to be careful of IP. And we do, as I covered, offer investors a lot of different information. The strategies we've launched have long track records, flagship funds, popular, well-tenured PMs, et cetera. So ETF investors will be able to see the track record of these PMs, and they can understand our investment story and the results over time. Um, in addition, we will be providing the, the quarterly holdings disclosure, monthly uh, portfolio characteristics, and daily uh, proxy basket IIV and uh, risk metrics. So I think we're giving a lot of information out. We're protecting, we're, go, we're not going as far as releasing our holdings daily. But again, this is coming from a good spot so that we can protect the performance of our investors. Yep, understood. Well, unfortunately, we are a little bit past time. Thanks, folks, for sticking with us. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Special thanks to James Scott uh, and Tim uh, and T. Rowe Price for sponsoring this. As a reminder, uh, there will be a recorded version of this available uh, shortly after the call is completed, uh, usually by tomorrow for sure, and you'll receive an email uh, notifying of you, you when that's available. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. We hope you'll join us again in the future, and have a great rest of your day.